the woundedness. <laughs> some of us, it's like here. Some of us, it's like here, here. Place your hands on that, those, that wounded place or places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there could be many places. Touch them. And I want you to look around at every single person here is touching different parts of their bodies. We're all in need of healing. We're all in it together. You know, sometimes I wonder, is it possible to fix all of this? Or maybe part of it is it's all about forgiveness. Forgiveness of ourselves, forgiveness of other, one another, because we're all a mess. <laughs> we're all a little bit of a mess. And then we have this thing about hiding it. So thank you for showing us some of those places where those wounds are. Thank you for making it a little bit safer and a little more human. Now I want you to reach out and extend love and healing, especially to those places of healing. I see you. I care about you. And for the new people, we don't want to spotlight them and scare them away or anything, but welcome, whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey. I do want to welcome Larry. Did I say, oh, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> Kelly. Kelly. Kelly, who's our guest to accompany us because... Um, you know, usually the week after Easter, um, the staff kind of falls apart, you know, so <laughs> we have one down. <laughs> Rob, Rob got COVID, so um, he, he, yeah, he's recovering, yeah, and Adam gratefully didn't get it. Nope. I was worried about him because they drive a lot together, but um, so thank you, Kelly, for being here, and everyone else, welcome this morning. Peace. Peace. Okay, so this, these questions, you can be seated now, too. Well, you do everything I say. I could say stand up and touch your head, <laughs> stand up, touch your shoulders, your knees and toes. No. <laughs> so before we get into this very familiar reading, I want to ask you a few more questions. Um, again, why do we tend to conceal those scars, the scars that we have? You don't have to answer it because I know it's a very private question. This is just for you. Why do we conceal those scars that we have, those physical, emotional scars? What is our assumption about what would happen if we expose them? And so just sit, sit with those questions. And so this morning's gospel reading comes from the fourth gospel. Let me just put this down. We don't need it anymore. We'll move it away. It's the fourth gospel, the gospel according to John. And those of you who are familiar with John's gospel, it's really different from the first three gospels. It was written much later. There's much more in it where Jesus is presented as much more godlike with knowing everything that's going to happen. Um, and um, much more mystical, much more trying to separate from Jewish roots. Um, and speaking to a community that was much more persecuted by the Roman Empire. So here are these reading, this reading from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. In the NIV, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed that they had seen the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
And with that, he breathed upon them again and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciple told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So I want to Given this story and what we know about what happened with Jesus and his relationship with his disciples, I want to ask you to answer these questions as it relates to Jesus' scars. What scars do you imagine Jesus carried with respect to his closest friends, the disciples? What emotional scars? I mean, we know physically. He was crucified. There were all kinds of scars. He had, I mean, his body was torn apart. It was horrible. But what about emotionally with his disciples? What would you say? I think he might have been a little pissed. <laughs> a little angry, a little disappointed. Like, what would you have said to these people who said, I will never betray you. I'm with you through it all. Huh? Sit. Come on. Loss of trust, big time. Abandonment. Betrayal. How about how would you feel about Judas? Maybe it's complicated. It's really complicated. Those are really human responses something we can all relate to. So there are these physical wounds and there are these psychological wounds. How do you think the disciples, what about the disciples' wounds? There they are. They had, a, they had a dream. They put everything else aside in their life to follow Rabbi Jesus. And then this happens. They were utterly destroyed by it. And they also were utterly terrified because look at what the Roman Empire did. They arrested him and tortured him and executed him. With a big sign, like, this is what happened when you mess with Rome. And so what did they do? It's just like a clenched fist. They locked themselves in to protect themselves. Did you ever do that to your own heart? I'm going to create these metal bars so nobody can get in. And then you find yourself imprisoned in them. Life can really wear us down. So that's where they were. Locked in fear. John's Gospel sometimes talks about locked in fear of the Jews, like there's been a lot of anti-Semiticism in um, John's Gospel. I like that this translation says the Jewish leaders. It was really like a collusion between the Roman Empire and the Jewish leaders, especially because it was the Passover, you know, the High Holy Days, and here's Rabbi Jesus, who's a revolutionary. You know, good news to the poor, freedom to the captives. They were a poor people occupied by an empire. And here's the Passover, the remembrance of the exodus from slavery into freedom. And here's this rabble rouser. 
So how do you imagine they felt afterwards? The week after. The week after he was executed. Scared. Scared. Probably disappointed. Disappointed. Maybe even they felt dead. Grieving. Now what? Yeah. I did have a sermon here. Let me see. <laughs> I just thought, sometimes, you know, one of the biggest wounds I think we have, I'm just being real, I'm like completely, like, I think our country, our community, all of us, especially after COVID, after covering our bodies and our faces with these masks and being so physically separated, I think one of our biggest woundednesses is that we are so separate from one another. We're so lonely. I think one of our biggest wounds is to just create safe places where we can really be real with one another, where we can really see one another, see each other's wounds. And that takes safety, that takes trust, that takes compassion, that takes forgiveness. And that's why I've come to love this story. Because maybe we can't fix it all, but we can forgive. And we can develop this capacity to be bigger than our wounds. I have to say, just to back up, I can't believe how many people are here. I was convinced. I was like talking with, um, I think it was Carl. Yeah, the two people will show up the week after. Because there's like, I don't know about you, but it's like there's really, there can be really low adrenaline after any big event. And especially, look at how glorious it is. And I'm like, I'm, it's kind of a miracle. Look at so many of us are here today. Um, including, including me. Yeah. And I think it's, um, I think it's, in some ways, some of that feeling is like the week after kind of experience. Have you ever had that? The week after, whether it's good news or bad news. The week after the wedding, the graduation, the birth, or the bad news, the week after the divorce, the diagnosis, the death. Think of those wounds again that we've had, we've all had. The question now what? What's next? I know life is going to be different, but how? And it's too soon to tell. And I think for followers of of Jesus or in any religion that has any kind of expectation about how it how a course is supposed to be. We've been through this course of 40 days of Lent, and then here we are to Easter, and we're supposed to be singing, Christ is risen, and everything's supposed to be great. And then the problem is the world isn't, that, it, it's not different, right? We're still slammed by life. At least I am. Work or retirement or loneliness or health issues, shaken by the headlines if you allow yourself to really take it to heart. Waking up at night, wondering about the future. Wasn't something supposed to happen inside? Where's the resurrection? Any of you have those feelings? Like, isn't it supposed to be happening? Like, right on schedule? (laughs) And so we turn to these Gospels. You know, we turn to many sources. And so let's see what we can find in these Gospels. And there aren't that many week after Gospel stories. Mark, his original ending, I mentioned on Easter, ends in such a stark way with an empty tomb, Jesus' empty tomb. And Matthew has this great commissioning to his disciples. He appears briefly and then disappears. He's, he ascends into heaven. Mary's assumed, but Jesus ascends. He's got more rocket power, I guess. And then Luke, the story of the stranger on the road to Emmaus, where they're talking 
He doesn't recognize the stranger. It's kind of like that gardener story. And, and the moment he recognizes, they recognize, he's gone. What's that? Kind of a, it's weird, but maybe it's sort of that mystery. Like we know these stories so well, we know how they're supposed to go out. So there's something, that awe, that wonder, like, wow, how did I recognize something so familiar in a stranger? It's not something we can hold on that tightly to. John is the only one that seems to linger in what it's like the week after the week after Easter. He's the only one with this week after story about Thomas. Otherwise, sometimes how many of you learned about him as doubting Thomas? You're a doubting Thomas. It's usually not a compliment. You're a doubting Thomas. Because supposedly Thomas had some trust issues. <laughs> or at least that's the claim. I don't think he was any less trusting than any of those other dis male disciples. Remember when the women went to the tomb and they come running back and they say, we've seen the Lord, we've seen him. Did they believe them? No. What did they say? It's just idle women talking. And the disciples still weren't believing. They were in the upper room. They had to run and see for themselves and yet they're still scared. Right? They, they're in that room, locked behind closed doors. And when Jesus returned to the house, somehow getting through those doors, maybe like their boundaries, he was able somehow to get through to them, or the idea of him, or the memory, who knows what? Who knows? They believed because they experienced him for themselves somehow. But Thomas wasn't there. He didn't get to see anything for himself, which is why he had the same questions that they did. They had evidence. He had hearsay. How many of you go on hearsay? How many of you like to have the direct experience? I mean, scientists in the room, speak up. Come on, we need the evidence, right? We need the facts. Right? Sometimes hearsay, you know, you can get wrong information or misinterpretation from somebody else. Show me the data. That's respectable. I trust that. And also, how many of you, it's like, oh, that's great that Jesus was raised from the dead, whatever that means, or Lazarus. What about me? How many of you are like, I long for the direct experience myself, my own resurrection? whatever that means, my own rising after the dead. How many of you, like, that's part of what it's about. It's not just a one-time experience, yeah. I personally like Thomas. I was, you know, I've been taught, you know, early on to disapprove of him. You should just believe, put aside all doubt and just believe because that's what faith is. Anybody else? have that early trauma, that early scar. <laughs> Just put aside doubt and believe. Like the other disciples, Thomas loved Jesus. He witnessed something extraordinary. His countercultural act of resistance, refusing to stop loving this broken, wounded, beautiful world. He'd witnessed how Jesus healed that brokenness, that injustice, and restored harmony with every word and every action. He also witnessed how Jesus had tried to warn them and prepare them. Jesus knew what was coming if he stayed the course. And he tried to prepare them for his own death but nothing prepared them for the brutality of it. And so afterwards, Thomas was ruined. He was as ruined as the rest of them after what happened. And then he was as confused and baffled as, as all the other ones when Mary came back second time from the grave and said, we've seen the Lord.
And since he wasn't there with the other 12 disciples, he became the missing disciple. Maybe he was out doing reconnaissance work, trying to figure out what was going on. He was being like an investigative reporter. Did somebody steal the body? You know, what happened? Where, what's going on? He wasn't in the house with the others that night. He wasn't locked in fear. That's pretty courageous. He's trying to figure out what's going on. But he wasn't there when Jesus gave peace and forgiveness of all the things. What would be the first thing? You're Jesus walking in with your friends. What would you say? <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Like, where the hell were you? Like, oh God, I was all alone. Are you my friend? He knew that that's how they'd feel. They were ashamed. They felt awful. They were terrified. And he gives them peace. He gives them forgiveness. Who's not afraid of death? Of course they were afraid. Of course they felt horrible. He breathed new life into them that way. It's like it's literally, they couldn't breathe. They couldn't breathe because they were so afraid, they felt so bad, and so lost about the future. It was like they had the breath knocked out of them. Anyone here ever have a panic attack? So what's it like? Yeah, trauma. I've been with a couple of people who have had panic attacks, and the way they describe it, they feel like they're going to die. Their heart, it's like my heart, I think I'm having a heart attack. There's this cold sweat that's happening. Um, it's just, you're frozen in fear. And I think about, like, the disciples being that terrified. Or, and I think about not even being able to breathe because you're so locked up. And then I can't, I can't help but remember... Um, Eric Gardner, George Floyd, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. No breath means no life. There's no way forward without breath. And I think that's their experience before Jesus mysteriously returns somehow. We don't know how. Breathless fear like divine CPR. The breath, they had to breathe so they could just be present to the peace and the compassion and the forgiveness that he was giving them, that he had the capacity to give to them. The love. And so Thomas wasn't there for it. And he wants that experience too. And it's interesting because he, 
you know, is it that he wants physical proof that Jesus was raised from the dead? Or is there something in particular, he says, unless I see the wounds. He doesn't say unless I see Jesus' face. Unless I see the wounds. Maybe he thinks Jesus wasn't really crucified. It was a pseudo-Jesus. Somebody else was up there. It was a, um, yeah, some, a look-alike or something. It wasn't really him. Perhaps. But maybe, maybe what he really wants by seeing those wounds to be able to touch them is he, he wants to know that Jesus hasn't come back divorced from all of that. That it's not like he's, he's just brand new Jesus. That it's the one who was wounded. He wants to see his woundedness and he wants to see his capacity to live on with his wounds, which is kind of what we all want in our lives. I mean, life just kind of wears you down. Look at little kids, like, they have no idea. Like, it's like the innocence that we have. It's like, maybe he wanted to know that Jesus was able to rise up again because there are many deaths in our lives. Maybe we want to know that about ourselves too. So if that's possible, maybe Thomas isn't looking for physical proof of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He's looking for this existential proof that the one God raises up is the same one who is damaged beyond repair. Evidence that it's a particular kind of Messiah. It's a suffering servant who knows all about the most breathtaking of human suffering and has the capacity to respond with love and hope. I've been thinking about who are those heroes that we have now who have lived on despite the wounds that they've incurred and I have been thinking a lot about John Lewis. Um, recently, one of my closest friends um, shared a quote by John Lewis. It's really it's stayed with me this week, and I want to share it with you. But I think, you know, once in every generation, we're lucky enough that someone comes about who, with every aspect of their life, their being, models how to put love at the very center and the center holds solid, even though everything around it falls apart. That place becomes unbreakable like a fulcrum of change for life, something very internal. And so I think about John Lewis, you know, who started off as the you know, son of sharecroppers in Alabama and southern Alabama and large, huge family. Talk about wounds that he must have experienced as a kid, physical and psychological, the way he saw his parents treated, the way he saw the, the name calling, um, the segregation, what kind of like riding on a bus and going to the poor black school and um, separate drinking fountains and just the, um, the dehumanization on so many levels John Lewis, he began his life preaching to chickens when he was four years old. He wanted to be a preacher. <laughs> and sometimes those chickens would say, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> sometimes they'd walk away. <laughs> and he went on to teach a nation and a world how to step into that rare kind of courage. The same countercultural resistance, a refusal to give up loving this broken, beautiful world with every fiber of his being throughout his career, first as a civil rights leader, as young as 21, and then later as a congressman, he upheld that stubborn, splendid refusal as the crucible of justice, of progress, of human harmony. And he upheld it despite being imprisoned 47 times, 
despite being bombarded numerous times by tear gas, despite being swarmed numerous times by state troopers, you know, wielding bats and attack dogs. And one time it was so bad when he was 25 years old and he's marching side by side peacefully with civil rights protesters across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. One officer took a bat and smashed his head and he recalled thinking, this is it, I'm gonna die and he was rushed to the hospital. Fractured his skull. Don't you think he had a lot of wounds? Don't you think it'd be pretty hard to love police officers, <laughs> white people, this country? Would it be pretty easy to just curl up and say, forget it, it's just about my life. So hear these words from his 2012 memoir entitled Across That Bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, or across whatever bridge you know, we might be thinking of, from separation and division and conflict to peace, life lessons and a vision for change, Lewis writes, our actions entrench the power of the light on this planet. Every positive thought we pass between us makes room for more light. If we do more than think, then our actions clear the path for even more light. That is why forgiveness and compassion become the more important principles in life. A century, a hundred years after Tolstoy wrote to Gandhi, they had a long correspondence about why we as humans hurt one another and how to stop. Tolstoy wrote to Gandhi and said, love is the only way to rescue humanity from all of this. And so John Lewis, a hundred years later, writes this. And this is the part I love. This is what my, one of my closest friends shared with me just this past week. Anchor the eternity of love in your own soul and embed this planet with goodness. Lean toward the whispers of your own heart. Discover the universal truths and follow its dictates. Release the need to hate, to harbor division and the enticement of revenge. Release all bitterness Hold only love, only peace in your heart, knowing that the battle of good to overcome evil is already won. Choose confrontation wisely, but when it is your time, don't be afraid to stand up, speak up, and speak out against justice. And if you follow your truth down the road to peace, and the affirmation of love, if you shine like a beacon for all to see, then the poetry of all the great dreamers and philosophers is yours to manifest in a nation, a world community, a beloved community that is finally, finally at peace with itself. John Lewis believed, without the evidence, that the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act would come John Lewis believed that the battle of good to overcome evil is already won. It was the evidence of things unseen. And he fought nonviolently. He fought with love, with every fiber of his being, with peace in his heart. Did he come through on the other side of that bridge without his wounds? No, he had his wounds in the midst of rejoicing. One of my favorite teachers says, if you're still breathing, there's more right with you than is wrong with you. And so take a breath, my dear ones, this week after Easter. Blessed are you who have not seen and yet believe. Amen. 
And now we'll join in our sermon response um, in the Skyline Songbook number 12, How Can I Keep From Singing? I'm sorry, I think it's